I'd like to introduce you to our uh, final speaker before dinner break and before moving on to the Fun Palace. Those of you who will be joining us What? The fun isn't, hot, isn't Klaus on right now? <laughs> oh, this is Klaus? Yeah. Oh. Agency, algorithms, and a new form of oppression. Mm -hmm. And I take, and everyone takes as a positive side of cybernetics. <laughs> and I'm also very positive. But we have to see the dark side. And that is what I got to do. I will just talk about some basic concepts. And uh, maybe I should look at this here. Anyway, some basic concepts. Then I will talk about the kind of algorithms we live with. And then what we can do, and then I give time to another summary. And I hope the summary is somewhat more positive. Cybernetics started actually only with Norman Greenock, but there was something much more earlier in the, in, um, in the, uh, the 400 BC, there was a kind of a, a catalog of technology, and he found there are certain kinds of mechanisms that could not be explained. And that's where oil lamps, and later on it became water clocks and so on. So it's, 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 that's, just, that's the way it started. And then uh, 2,000 years later, we had the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution was fueled by what, steam engines, among others. And the critical part is actually uh, that regulator. That regulator was there. And you can say, this is the cybernetic mechanism, but nobody recognized it. There were no theories about it. And nobody, this was just a technology. And uh, I think at Norbert Wiener's time, objectively speaking, he didn't invent circularity. There were, uh, there were uh, lots of circuits, general basic mechanisms already in the industry. There were lots of things already there. But he, what he did is he actually developed the mathematics. And that's where the world started with the issue of self-reference. And, um, Excellent software. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and this is distorted. But the point is actually that he, he started with the issue of the eigenvalues. Uh, I mean, a, a function that applies on a lot of things and always ends up with the same kind of value. The square root, if you, whatever number you have, it, if you repeatedly, it, it ends up number one. The next thing is was actually to apply this to servo mechanisms. And the servo mechanism is again an eigen function, but there is a perturbation. So the, the, the perturbation is regulated away in favor of some desirable output. Norbert Wiener, in one of the famous documents that he always carried around and didn't show anyone, was a, a yellow folder, and he uh, had their ideas of, for example, gold-seeking missiles and all of these kind of things. So it's very military. But the point was actually, it was based on the issue of, of solar mechanisms, which we know from, from a lot of things. And so they are adaptive, adaptive to the environmental disturbances. Ross Ashby took this thing one step further, and he said, well, maybe we could change the nature of the mechanism. And, and he talked about self-organization. That means you have a set of organizations or a set of structures. And as soon as the organism uh, reaches the possibility of, of the difficulty function, or change the organization or change the algorithms. And so then by making machines that are not easily predictable. Because the number of uh, algorithms that could be stored, whatever, are finite with these ex experiments, but this was very difficult to predict. So then we go, of course, to Maturana. And Maturana uh, was a very different idea, but it's a different kind of circularity than Denmark of production. The idea that a network of components produces the very components that are part of the network that produces. Uh, this, this is something that is very difficult technologically to reproduce, but maybe in some sense it is. That's one thing. But then Hans von Furser, in my opinion, Hans von Furser, uh, how should I say, psychologized or cognitive 
highest cybernetics. I think the observer is in fact the one who that, 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 uh, something is missing, and I hope that doesn't continue. Um, anyway, that there's supposed to be a, a loop in, within the uh, observer construction. Um, the point is that the first ball of cybernetics deals with, according to him, with the description of what is outside, and the second ball of cybernetics describes the outside plus the observer. So in some sense, he, he, he made it cognitive. And also a, a big complaint I have is that he deals with description. And he said, in fact, the logic of the world is the logic of description of the world. As if description was never that. That's a good right? comment. Uh, and then Ashby, on the other hand, he had a very different notion. Um, that we, for him, uh, a cybernetician was kind of an activist. And a designer, a designer of possible machines. And he said always that cybernetics is the study of all conceivable systems that one can construct. And whether they function or whether they cannot be built is kind of secondary. So for him, I think the issue of design is key, and that's sympathetic for me, because I am, by history, the designer. Now, I, I, I want to just say that we're talking quickly about circularities here. And so many things, the loops, and, and I think one should really separate what kind of loops we're talking about. So, for example, we need to distinguish the kind of the objects like the oil lamps and the regulator that have to be the, the quality of maintaining themselves. That doesn't mean that, that they're circular. By theory, yes, but not by observation. We know a biological system, us, we, we maintain a lot of things, but we, we are not aware of, our, of circularities. So then the next level, if you want, of circularity is one of explaining it, verbally explaining it, narratives. And we talk about positive and negative feedback. And, but these are verbal descriptions, which, which are nice and to help us understand certain kind of things. But I think the main starting point of, of, of more serious cybernetics began actually with self-referential mathematical descriptions. That is a very simple, a simple one, and they are including the law of forms, where the self-reference is critical. That means the operand and the operator is related by function and reproduces itself. And then we have to look at uh, the kind of algorithms that we can con uh, construct uh, based on that. And finally, the, the networks of algorithms. But let me, let me go to the, the best second, second uh, concepts that is very important. And then you have to remember, you probably know that all, but I do think I would like to make it clear. An um, algorithm uh, well defined unambiguous and detailed instructions that were then implemented to determine the recursive computational practices that transform a given set of data into another set of data. If you want a computer, it's just run by algorithms. And they are very determined. That means whenever you start at the same starting point, you end up with the particular starting point that, that it is programmed for. So I think algorithms are important and derived actually from the mathematical description. I would say any mathematical description, once it is specific enough and doesn't leave any loose ends, becomes an algorithm. And algorithms you know, can be very simple, like multiplication, or an aptitude test, intelligence test, or a statistics. You have a set of data and you get a result and the in between is, is an algorithm taking care of that, or bank teller machines. There are, there are me mechanisms that are algorithmic determined, depending on what kind of data they are uh, accepting, they come to a predictable results. And so I think they can be very complex, we know that, and I think I will talk about that a little later. But it, the, the, the point it, it has to be said, algorithms are human artifacts. They don't grow on trees, and um, <laughs> they represent human conceptions. Without that, there are no algorithms. 
<laughs> so I think algorithms are designed by someone um, that one has to hold that much accountable for, if you want, but they are given assignments, assignments from corporations as to what to do, implement these algorithms and in a way uh, that works for them, and that's the reason why I ask you for what and who it works. Well, it is usually there is some sort of a user that is connected with the with the model. Man can say black box, but it is not quite a black box. It is programmed by an algorithm. And I want to be sure that you know that an algorithm is like an instruction for a machine, and it is a human creation, and it is not there in, in, in the world. The second one, to me, that's very important, is human agents. I am, I'm very uncertain about, we, we talked about it, about anything beyond his fundamental starting point of a distinction. An agent is one who is capable of making a distinction and then acting on it. Now, the act of making a distinction is already an act. And, and there are lots of theories that people respond to this type of diet and, uh, stimulus or that type of this. This is, this is already reducing the, the, uh, the, the human being to the beginning of a machine. You have to make a distinction first, and then you can act on it. To me, I think agency implies choices, actions, uh, movements, automation, or whatever. The point is again that to keep that in mind, the step is to make a first make a distinction, and without this distinction, you cannot make a choice. And then you act on it and everything else follows. So and to me this is very important. How do you know? How do we know that someone makes a distinction? How do you know that someone is an actor? How do you understand someone else's understanding? You can't. How do you know what someone else thinks? We can't. We don't know. We can't open their brains, and even if we do, we won't find anything. Um, but, but actually, uh, I mean, agency per se is not observable. But agency is revealed by agents giving other agents as to what they were thinking, what they were doing, what their intentions are. So I think, to me, agency is not a physical phenomenon. Agency is a phenomenon that is basically social. Yeah. That means where certain kinds of things are articulated and, if you want, negotiated. And agency is established actually in words, not in, in the mind. I think what I don't want to make sure that you're not confusing the two kinds of concepts accountability and responsibility. Responsibility is either assigned from an authority or assumed for something to do. The parent assumes responsibility for their children, but if you are hired, then someone tells you, you are in charge of this. This is responsibility. That's not accountability. Accounts may be offered either voluntarily in when you propose an action, or they may be requested by someone to give you to that you can give an account and you can either explain it, offer it, negotiate it, you can also conceivably refusing to give an account, which in the sense is, is also the claim of authority. You know, you can't, uh, you, well, anyway. uh, so there are several movements, several accounts, and I think I base my my notion of G. White Mills through 1940 uh, by studying power elite in the United States. And, and you know, this, this is again one of those metaphors that as soon as you talk about power, you talk actually about physics or you can pour physical metaphors. And he was the one who systematically went away, away from that and said, well, what the power in, in meetings is, how do you explain the action? And he, he came to the distinction that there are these four kinds, five kinds, and, and one, one can also find more final distinctions. But the justification is a, is a claim that one has acted something, proposed something, and it is, has virtue. 
Most proposals in, in, in board meetings are in fact including this already. In fact, we want to produce this kind of phenomena as a bit of the benefit. So there are already the accounts uh, of agency there. Apologies on admit actually agency, you have done something dumb and you promise not to do it again. And explanations admit that you maybe have not been very clear or not, not sensitive enough to, to the audience and you spoke uh, a different language and you didn't know that they couldn't understand it. But this, then you can explain it and fix it, so to speak. Excuses basically deny agency. That means saying, I'm not, this is not my, I'm not uh, responsible for that. I cannot be blamed. And then there's scapegoating when, when I'm saying, I'm not responsible, but this guy is. So the point is actually that agency is established within these, and maybe some more, accounts that people give in response to either requests or without requests. So, so and I would it's very important again, when we come back to agency, as algorithms, <laughs> algorithms do not have agency. Why? You can't hold them responsible. I think this is important. We, we often confuse um, machines, agents, uh, machines as agents, and we say, the computer tells me that. No, the computer doesn't tell me anything. <laughs> the, the point is actually that there's a fundamental difference between agency, which has to do with language, and you cannot establish language or uh, agency without language. There are lots of theories that are determinist. And these, they unilaterally, I would say, they are unilaterally denying that there is agency. Animism, the belief that natural objects, stones can hit you. It's a bogus. Stones can't. Stones have no agency. Or volcanoes want to ruin the, the island. Nothing of that sort. Religious determinism, you know? God tells you so. You know? Or Rudolf Natur and so on, the actor actor next network theory. I don't know if you know that. It's a sociological theory saying we should not look at human agency. They are just like any machine. They are physical, physically exertion of things, and everything else is meaningless. Or, or Foucault. Foucault had like, this kind of a discourse analyst who said, well, the discourse of a certain area determines how you write, how you think, and what you do. That is determinism. There is no agency. Roberto Matarano is, in my nature, this is going to be believe in structural determinism. It's also, there is no agency. This is kind of a very common, common description saying, we have the illusion that we control our thoughts and decisions. In fact, our bodies, internal systems, make us decisions. Before those decisions come into our thinking and feeling, we have all the illusion that, in the sense that we subjectively perceive things. In essence, our thinking and feeling is superficial illusion, an illusionary process, helpful in many ways as an additional interface for the body and the world, but superficial and un an underlying causal internal processes. I would not doubt this, except it's meaningless. The point is actually that we <coughs> act as agents, we hold each other accountable for it. If you go to a court, you can't say, oh, my thoughts, my stealing came automatically, and so that was not, at least for most people, <coughs> The point is actually agency is a social construct. It's not physical, and he may be right, I do not know. And uh, lots of theorists uh, say that it's an illusion. Free will is an illusion that doesn't exist. And maybe it doesn't exist. That's, that's not the point. It exists socially. Agency is a social construct. Uh, in criminal court, agency is actually what is established in some form or the other. And we accept that we elect officials in order to for, uh, act on our behalf. And also agents may lie. And to me, that's also interesting. 
Asians being lying. And then right now we have great experiences in, in the United States. But if nobody can show that it is a lie, and everyone agrees with what it is, then it is what it is. So I mean, it's not a question of truth or falsity. It's a question of social acceptability. And um, you know, being a disingenuine is also a social construction. The, the judgment that, that someone lied and, and, and to deceive you. From a cybernetic point of view, and this goes now seemingly on an automatic thing, but if, if you think of the loops, they are not causal, they are reflexive. And maybe I just go quickly to the seems to be automatically one. Sometimes, uh, you know, the social psychologist said, when we talk, all always have in mind already what account we would give if someone asked us. In fact, we, would, we cannot even talk to someone else without that phenomenon. We have a, an understanding of others and also an understanding of what they might say if they hear us saying that. So that is a, that's automatic. Let me now go to the other concept. And oppression usually is associated with living in an authoritarian regime where discrimination of civil rights have been denied, discrimination between different populations is rampant, etc., etc. Well, Max Weinbaum, sociologist, he said that this is often unnoticed oppression, largely because the privileged class, the dominant class, sees no problem in talking about the minority as inferior. And in fact, you can look yourself in, in the United States or Nazi Germany, whatever, that, that is the case. The ruling class has no place for oppression because they are the ruling class. And I'm, I'm saying that as class, but simply superior in some form. I would say that oppression uh, resides in the, uh, in, uh, with the explainable experience of being entrapped and fears of lack of uh, resources to exercise human agency. You're trapped. You cannot do certain kinds of things. And this is manifest in, in the inability of unwillingness. By inability, I mean they say they can't do it. They, they have no basis for examining where the oppression comes from. Or are unwilling. That means it is careless, they take it for granted. So I think to me, oppression has something to do with being entrapped in, and the unable, to, um, unable to exercise agency. And the, the blind compliance seems to be the only uh, acceptable alternatives. No. Okay, now I want to just ask myself, where, what we, do we do with agents? Now, we can say normally we interact as human beings with our just ordinary human on an ordinary human scale, and but the first and oldest perhaps technology is something that extends certain senses. Uh, for example, right. Uh, now that is not, not particularly cybernetic, but I think to me that is very important. Writing is very convenient. And you could have your thoughts and so on, piece of paper or on stones and all. But, but the, the, the uh, social consequences are enormous. And we know that writing, the invention of writing, was a source of empire building. How come? Well, writing is more durable than verbal communication, more detached, detached from the source. There doesn't need to be authors, can be on pieces of paper. The Egyptian empires were entirely built on, on writing, and that is a social consequence of the minor convenience of putting a piece of paper. And that is, you can see similar things with the telephone. The telephone was also a mere extension beyond, let's say, human voice. You put in a wire and you talk to a lot of people, and that's fine. Nobody has a problem. However, the consequences 
of that social consequences of the norms. Distribution of, of uh, activities, coordination beyond uh, local things. Actually, I was thinking also uh, in the history of the United States when uh, Washington's army were uh, relying on, uh, on horse uh, uh, observers that came and told them where the enemies are, etc., etc. Well, that, that was a different kind of war than now. Where we a telephone call, observe, and whatever. So the life was totally different. And the, the, the apparent convenience of just extending the ability to, to communicate from, from the direct human contact to the wire, that made a great difference. And we accept that as action. And email and social networks, but that, that is a further extension. You know, it's good to have friends, there's no problem. <laughs> Even though what kind of friends is another issue. It, it, it changes the political uh, nature of, uh, of, of politics. Uh, that that uh, our spring is a result basically of the ability to, um, to communicate and coordinate uh, on the internet. The next thing is kind of this amplification of routine human efforts. And, and I'm saying, for example, uh, calculated spell checks, very convenient. And I think there is no, no problem using that. And you, you have no, I mean, for you, it's fine. But what you're doing is actually you, you feed an enormous industry by, by the very fact of doing this. I have to, when you click and say, I like it, that is immediately a, a, a part of the data that you contribute for an institution of which you can have very little influence and no knowledge. The, but the amplification is another a phenomenon that, that when, you, when you think of the amplification issue, um, that once you, once you have spell channels, once you have search engines, you, you forget or you unlearn the ability to do this yourself. Like the GPS is a good example. When you have a GPS, you don't need to know what the environment is like. like you're a pilot. You, you're perfectly okay. independent. So there's an institutionalization uh, of that phenomenon, which you don't notice, or minimally notice. The next thing is to me is replacing occupational routines, the teller machine. Well, we know what a back teller is, and you can still have the same kind of conceptions. You can maybe go to the machine and say, you know, you have to identify yourself. You have to get the, get the money, you get to know your account or whatever. But that's, that's very, very human and cool. So there's an institutionalization uh, of that phenomenon, which you don't notice, or minimally notice. The next thing is to me is replacing occupational routines, the teller machine. Well, we know what a back teller is, and you can still have the same kind of conceptions, you can maybe go to the machine and say, you know, you have to identify yourself, and you have to get the, get the money, you have to know your account, or whatever. But that's, that's very, very human and cool. But or if you continue that, you know, customer service calls, and you know what, what the new system is, if you want to get an answer, and you will get to, to a chain of things, it is just that we are systematically The next thing is to me is replacing occupational routines, 
the teller machine. Well, we know what a backteller is, and you can still have <laughs> the same kind of conceptions. You can maybe go to the machine and say, you know, you have to identify yourself, and you have to get the, get the money, you have to know your account, and whatever. But that's, that's very, very human and cool. But, or if you continue that, you know, custom service calls, and you know how, what the new system is, if you want to get an answer, and you will get to, to a chain of things, it is just, we are systematically um, replacing actually jobs by, by algorithms. that it is 5.37. I don't want to shut down any conversation like that, but just so that you know, uh, again, Fun Palace Bus is leaving at 6.30. Some people may choose to run and eat. Some people may want to talk now. Remember, food truck at Fun Palace. If you want to wait and eat there, and chances to eat in English Bay. Uh, make your decisions as you will. Uh, and uh, would you like to take some questions, Flo? Yes, please. Yeah, give us that. I think I thank you for that. I find this very elegant argument. You gotta get back to the room. Uh, but I just want to zoom in on the attribution of agency as a way to make decisions after the decision. Does that in some way delegate the rest of nature to not what was not? No, it says it takes it away. Because an agent is someone who makes decisions and choices. Has choices. But, but again, you can, of course, you have an agent, you okay, could, right. agent could be designing algorithms. Right, but does that attribution in some way remove agency from the natural world, from animals, from... I would say agency it, it, it distinguishes human beings from, from animals, yes. The fact is Abraham. And, and to me, it is very clear that this is a social phenomenon. And, and you can make in, in, in words and arguments, Look at you can find out how someone thinks, whether someone is in fact has made a decision, oh boy. or followed that, that some sort of a program, whatever. That, that, is, that has to come up in, in the action, and it's a certain phenomenon. And I think again, in the courts of law, they establish very carefully whether you have had the <coughs> to do something, whether you are capable of doing this, and this is all a question of, I have this person agency. Right. Beyond, let's say, a human voice, you put in a wire and you talk to a lot of people, and that's fine. And nobody has a complaint with that. However, you see, the consequences of that, the social consequences, are enormous. It's a distribution of, of uh, activities, coordination, beyond uh, mm -hmm. Local things. Actually, I was thinking also you know, the history of the United States when the Washington's army they were relying on uh, on horse uh, uh, observers that came and told them where the enemies are, etc., etc. Well, that that was a different kind of war than now, where we just made a telephone call, observe, and whatever. So it, it, the life was totally different, and the, the, the apparent convenience of just extending the ability to, to communicate from, from the direct human contact to the wire, that made a great difference. And we accept that as such. Right? And email and social networks, well, that, that is a further extension. You know, it's good to have friends. There's no problem. <laughs> Even though what kind of friends is another issue. The, the, the thing is, it changes the political uh, nature of, uh, of, of politics, you know, that, that the Arab Spring is a result basically of the ability to, um, to communicate and coordinate uh, on the internet. The next thing is kind of this amplification. Um, uh, yeah. Of routine human efforts. And I'm saying, for example, yeah, this is great. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, calculated, spell checkers, very convenient. And I think there is no, no problem using that. And you, you have no, I mean, for you, it's fine. But what you're doing is actually 
you, you feed an enormous industry by, by the very fact of doing this. I have to, this is uh, anyway, so you, uh, when you click and say, I like it, that is so immediately a, a part of the data that you contribute for an institution of which you can have very little influence and no knowledge. The, but the amplification is now a, a phenomenon that, that when, you, when you think of the amplification issue, um, that once you, once you have spell channels, once you have search engines, you, you forget or you unlearn the ability to do this yourself. Like the GPS is a good example. When you have a GPS, you don't need to know what the environment is like. like you're a liar. You, you're perfectly independent. Okay. So there's an institutionalization uh, of that phenomenon, which you don't notice, or minimal. The next thing is to me is replacing occupational routines. The teller machine. Well, we know what a back teller is, and you can still have the same kind of conceptions. You can maybe go to the machine and say, you know, you have to identify yourself, and you have to get the, get the money, you have to know your account, or whatever. So that's, that's very, very human and cool. But or if you continue that, you know, customer service calls, and you know what, what the new system is, if you want to get an answer and you will get to, to a chain of things, it is just that we are systematically um, replacing actually jobs by, by algorithms. And so to me, that it, this, is, this is, I think, a, a major social shift that we often don't notice. We might tolerate it as a nuisance. And then there are self-organizing population data surveys. That this is, I don't wish to be able to do it together. Back and forth. I agree with the next slide. The next one. Now this, you know, that I want to do this. The next one. This one? Yeah. There are huge mechanisms that deal with governments of people. When you want to have a loan, you apply and you are evaluated for your credit score. But it, that is not enough. Uh, there was actually a law made, uh, made that you shouldn't be at a credit score uh, used as a criteria. So the algorithm bypassed that. Depending on where you work, where you know, where you live. If you have a zip code of, uh, of an area that has low rates of, of compliance with, with money, you don't get a loan. When you have a name that sounds like black, you don't get a loan. So we are increasing the dependence on, on mechanisms that, that self-organize themselves and to produce actually what I could call normal curves. And the normal curve, we can actually have to here, but it has two ends, you know, one extreme and the other. And the, most businesses thrive on the middle. You know? Large quantity sales, big money, etc. etc. is all in the middle. And the outsiders, outlayers, are completely ignored. Now, if, if you are a minority, and if you fall in there, and you cannot get a loan, and you cannot get a, a job, this, what this produces actually precisely the thing, it amplifies precisely the differences. Think about it, intelligence, that to me is always very important. Intelligence tests. Well, there are intelligence people or not. And the, as you know, um, there is the so-called bell curve, and it turns out that the black population is on the lower end. And so if you know as an employer that all black people are on the lower end, why would you hire them? And why would you get them in fact a scholarship? So the more you know about the statistics, the more these differences are amplified rather than reduced. And then you can continue that in the moment with, oh, for example, 
another example. Uh, in Washington DC, the mayor of Washington said, uh, found out, or was told, that the education system is, is pretty bad. To improve on it, he, is, he decided to make a test and see how the teachers do. And so he, he developed that algorithm and found that about 350 teachers, they don't improve over time. Well, and there was one case that I read about. She was an exceptional teacher. She was, the parents liked the doctor a lot. She was nominated as the most outstanding teacher in the school. And she fell back and she was fired. Now, luckily, because she was so good, the superintendent got what her job in the private school. But the point is actually, she was teaching the, the underprivileged uh, students, and as a result, she, she didn't get this uh, high enough the, the scores. And she was an exceptional teacher, but the algorithm told them not to do it. You see the reason? In New Jersey, a judge wanted to release on a prisoner who was a model prisoner, and everyone said that he, he is perfect and he should be released. And everyone agreed with that. And then came an algorithm, no, oh, you can't do that. So then comes the, the judge and said, how come? Please explain to me the algorithm. No, proprietor. So what can you do? Now, and I would say that the issue of agency enters. He could actually ignore it and say, I don't care to them, but, and then release the prisoner. Or he could feel compliant. Now, it would be difficult, actually, when you think of it, to, to deny the algorithm, because if he later on is on record to have denied it, he will have great difficulties. As a result, you yield, and you get, keep a, a, a good person in prison. So I think the, the, the self-organizing population data, which you sometimes get when you when you buy a book and then you get all the books that, that are related and that you could also uh, be interested in, that is what 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 is sometimes helpful, no doubt, but it also ruins. The, the, the differences in, in, in the population. So I think uh, the next level, if you want, of algorithmization is a kind of big autonomous systems like the electric net in the US or stock market or military defense, etc., etc. Et and they're so big that you don't really know how they work. Um, you, you, you experience them when, when something goes wrong. When something goes wrong. When the electricity fails in New York and nobody knows how to fix it. But that is where the algorithms impinge on us, but only when they fail. However, to me, the, the critical part is that when you look at this kind of hierarchy, there is an increased loss of human agency and an increased reliance, willingness, I would say, uh, on, on machines that, that do all kinds of things unlike human beings. And I would say that, that is an increase in, in oppression. And it is a function of, I would say, the surrender of agency. It's not so that the, that the machines take away your agency. I think we, as human beings, surrender. Think about how often that happens when you go to the supermarket and you, you find there's something wrong, and then the question is, my computer says so. That's, that's submission. And I think the large institutions stand on the back of just minor tokens of benefits that we simply freely accept. So I, I think this is to be, um, it, it's a bit frightening. And I think the cybernetics is heavily involved in this. Um, what accounts for this kind of algorithmization? I don't want to go through all of it, but one of them is kind of a misconception of what algorithms do. Another one is a lack of transparency. 
who knows where they are? You don't know where they're located, you don't know who promotes it, who designed it, it's very difficult. Uh, or the hopelessness. In, uh, I think that much of system science is actually thrives on how hopeless it is, how complex the systems are. They're often very simple, actually, um, but one has to make an effort. Um, and the decoding of the algorithms of an existing machine is very difficult. So I think, to me, that is, that is I think, the big danger. So to me, algorithms, the big misunderstanding is that algorithms are more intelligent than human beings, are more reliable, and inherently fair to everyone, and more efficient, and um, can just deal with a lot of issues. You can, I can give you an example where that seems to be. Like, for example, larger issues. Who could possibly look for a, a piece of literature and go within a few seconds uh, to, to 20,000 documents? It, it's impossible. So there is an expansion uh, of, of something that is worthwhile for us, no doubt. But is it intelligence? I would say no. It is an aid, and it doesn't involve agency. I would say absolutely no. So I think these misconceptions result, I think, in my opinion, from the careless use of our own language. Maybe one of it is uncritically uh, attributing intelligence to artificial intelligence or machine learning to machine learning systems. Uh, the, the, what I said earlier, the, the uh, systems that learn to find the clues that predict a particular population and come up with names that, that sound black or uh, um, the, the addresses in poor neighborhoods and so on, you don't get them. Uh, something. You know, on, on all of these kind of phenomena, these are not learning, these are adaptive machines. And so, and, and then the second point was that actually this is deferring judgment to mechanical devices. We often say, we often delegate our intelligence to, to mechanical devices. Or when we talk about computer literacy, where it is involved in human beings, then you usually think only about someone who can handle the interface and not the social consequences. And, and finally, we think of big data as deeply a deeper understanding, far from so. So I think not realizing the, the, that, that, that we are actually on the receiving, human beings are on the receiving end and get only token benefits for the huge benefits of big organizations and society at large becoming increasingly efficient. So now what kind of secrets are there? I think, first of all, I would say debunking the belief in algorithms being intelligent. And, you know, claiming basically agency back. I think this, I see, for example, several of presentations, they talk too quickly about causal inferences, causal models. And as soon as we have causal models, we are aware of tech agency. So I think uh, narrative, the narrative, uh, these specifications, uh, one, has to, one has to look at. Um, no, no, it's, I think I get there. So, and and when they are, the, these algorithms are inherently uh, biased, I would say. Starting with the interest of the corporations to give the, the, the AI designers a uh, certain kind of jobs, continuing with the biases that the the, uh, the designers have racial biases, religious biases, your name. They're full of biases. And these biases are increasing, as I would say, the divisions, the, the distinctions in society when we take them into account. What about dating apps? You know, now, that, that objectively, there are some barriers against, against just the bonding. And I think, to me, it was important to take this as a project to debunk the false um, attribution of intelligence. One is that we have no way of, the, the, even the, the, uh, GI, the AI designers have no methodology to how to translate the narratives they get into algorithms. 
So, so reverse that is even more difficult. But most algorithms, they, they are developed in teams over time. Oh, yeah. Then the narratives evolve, some things are forgotten, then there are no more uh, small changes, and they're very difficult to trace. And finally, um, it is that in a competitive world, algorithms tend to be proprietary. Like if you make it in Google and, and, and so on, we don't know, and they will not tell us what kind of algorithm they have, mainly because they need to compete. So that is the second, the, the third part is kind of traditional. We talked a lot about black boxes. Um, usually you can kind of say reverse engineering. I don't want to talk too much about it. Um, and um, this, this is often very costly. In practice, these complex algorithms, they are very difficult to re-engineer. Maybe one can look at particular pieces that are wrong. But it, it will not help as much. You know? So that the fourth one is demand. This is a political move. It's demanding transparency. And that there are some communities, for example, in New Jersey, there, is, there are several cities that say all algorithms that we, as a city government, use must be transparent to the public. You know? But that's a good start. But, but it is, if you want, that's a political move which is worth undertaking. But there are also barriers. You know? Corporations uh, derive benefits from, from using it, they will not get it. And um, uh, declare them proprietary. And for, as far as HOV engineering is concerned, uh, I'm sorry about this. Uh, but, uh, as far as we engineering is concerned, you often have to, when you buy uh, a piece of software, you have to sign that you do not re engineer it. So then there are heavy protections against that. Um, so, and then I think one thing that, that is at the heart of my criticism. And that is actually a scientific issue. Um, one objection or one difficulty one faces is that the dominant, what, what's going on? the dominant scientific claims of authority, of truth, is done by scientists, irrespective of the consequences. Science has no way of <laughs> Science has no way of uh, asking the consequences. Uh, I think I, I almost switched off with this too troublesome. Yeah, well, I want to say the dominant scientific claims of authority for truth claims ignore the consequences. I'm often telling my my uh, my colleagues. As soon as you are in, in interviews have categories of what race you are, etc., etc., that introduces bias. Because ultimately, even, even if there is a good intention, once you have the notion of black in there, or foreigner, or non citizen, you can correlate with something else, and that produces all kinds of discrimination. I think one, one has to be extremely careful as a social scientist to, to do, not just to find the truth, or not to explain, or what the previously the speaker understand. That is unimportant. Now, I mean, maybe this is a step, but it's not enough. Understanding is not enough. One has to understand the consequences of publications, etc., etc. So, uh, and then there's a difficulty. Well, you can easily make a study and find correlations, but then how would you get from them to the consequences? Well, actually, that's what I hear many times. One has to ask the stakeholders. One has to see just what, how they would react to it. And that's not too really easy. But I think we have to somehow do that. Yeah, and then the uh, political and commercial institutions are uh, um, against it. 
But I would say much of scholarship fails to recognize the potential revolutionary aspect of thermodynamics. And it's very happy to have found things and found circularities, but not understanding that that is maybe wrong. So now, in sum, um, I think we have to realize that historically, mechanisms of thermodynamics have preserved, contained things, and are inherently conservative. Maybe because they're based on mechanisms, and mechanisms can now cre create anything outside for what they are built. So, <coughs> I think this rapid proliferation systematically preserves human agency. And, and previously formed, and this is a form of oppression, but the interesting part of it, there's no oppressor. And you can't ask the king or, or governor or a, a dictator accountable for it. It's diffused. It is, it's a form of oppression that we have not had, never experienced in that way. So and, I think, it, 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 and to me, it's not just the fault of the algorithm. It's a fault of us delegating in language the intelligence to others and submitting. And not, not willing to investigate what is it that that, that telling us. So this, I think they are analog to positive feedback in the sense that once the development of certain algorithms are different, they actually grow and grow and multiply and get more and more interaction. And actually, cybernetics, even though it all has narratively recognized positive and negative feedback, but it's rarely dealing with positive feedback of the kind that we experience. An explosion is a positive feedback. A runaway of inflation is a positive feedback. But this kind of a runaway technology has never been conceptualized. So <coughs> Yeah, to me, it's, it's the most important part is that language is not a causal system. Language is a combinatorial system. There are infinite numbers of expressions one can create within a certain time. And they're all possible, except for one important constraint. I mean, they must be understood. You can talk gibberish. But unless it's understood, it has no, no valid, validity. So, and I think we have to realize that this is a very different kind of a cybernetics that is based in language has to recognize that, that whatever has happened, the reality we construct is mutually constructed, is an, an, an enabled, and also an active. So, I think cybernetics has essentially failed in my traditional <laughs> to fail to address the consequences of its own language. And we talk about circularities and as if they are outside of us. And that's, I think, it's very important to talk always about things, about circularities and observers and observed systems, but not that we shape them. So I, I would say, um, now, I have to say, <laughs> make a course correction. And I, I wanted to say, we have to pursue kind of a discursive cyber ethics. But we <laughs> just, uh, over lunch, we talked. And, and I have to say, I, a long time ago, I read uh, the um, uh, Paul Frere's um, uh, book on, on uh, the pedagogy of the oppressed. And I read it at that time very differently. But now I realize that he was a set oppressors. Oppressed should not set either become oppressors or fight oppressors. You have to develop a pedagogy to get out of it, to be out of it. And I would like to change it. I would not advocate um, a cyber ethics, but a cyber pedagogy that eliminates or reduces the, the issue of uh, oppression. So, 
I, I would, would simply say yeah, that language is, is, is so important and we should realize that this is, that is the domain in which we have to operate. And it has to be an interdisciplinary language. That means not one that is uh, that's experts, cybernetic experts or what how to talk, but, but one that is um, that, that uses or relies on stakeholders of those that are have uh, that has uh, affected by this. So that I would uh, I would say that yeah, this is should I mean I would say the pedagogy of um, cybernetics has to really take the people into account, not the system. The system is secondary to the human constituents. I think it's a big mistake to talk about <coughs> systems and systems maintenance without thinking what happened to the people. So I think to me that is I mean, the very critical element that we have to, to look at, at the people that constitute the system. And there are good reasons for why they do this, and maybe bad reasons, uh, but they can tell us why they are part of it. And then the previous speaker has quoted me by saying uh, that, um, that you know, social organizations are networks of conversations that we really <laughs> start at some point. And that is our people. We, are, we have to deal with individuals that make up an organization. And so then, then in order to do this, we have to recognize there are these two loops, both in language. When we want this proposing possibilities, meaning proposing possibilities in language, not <coughs> things, and then being accountable for what we're proposing. And, and so and then um, and, and I would say prioritizing the voices of the constituents and uh, usually, <laughs> that, that's another, some of the different topics, I, I kind of like it, um, that big systems, ventricular twice individuals, basically make them say things they, they want them to say. Uh, when you think of big parties, Republican, no, Republican talks like no Republican, and that has to do with the Fox uh, News and whatever, they don't talk about themselves. They cannot even talk about themselves. So I think it is important to go to the experience of the individuals within a particular kind of system. So I think we, we have to liberate, we, we have to liberate people from, from oppression as much as possible. And I think the important thing is to find a balance between We have to find a balance between meaningful agency and dispensable agency. I mean, there are certain kinds of routine things that are boring, and we want to get rid of them. We don't want to get angry. For that, it is fine to have algorithms and take over it, like clocks, you know? like uh, whatever. There are lots of phenomena, but we should not promote uh, self-organizing systems, algorithms for our own sake, and not understand the consequences. So, I, I mean, I sat here the discourse of cybernetics, and I would now say the discourse of cybernetic um, pedagogy is one that is inter has an interdisciplinary language, it's concerned with social realities, but the very social realities it creates, not the descriptions of it, what it does. So that is, I think, it. You heard it so already that I wanted to say thank you. <laughs> But there are several books. One is Ashby, 
who is ultimately a determinist, but you had the idea of having moving out of mathematics in ways that allow that to be self-organizing system. The science of the artificial is also well known, but he is also dealing entirely with the design of algorithms. The next one is something that I like very recently, written Weapons of Math Destruction. And that shows me how algorithms systematically interfere with the social differentiation and enhance differences that otherwise would not come about. And then the next one is a book of artificial unintelligence. And I have it right, I recommend it to you. This is actually written by a program who realized that, that the algorithms that, that, um, that she was writing had actually nothing to do with human intelligence. Human beings <coughs> learn differently than really adapting the system. So, and the last one is actually, this is just now in print. This is a, a, a collection of essays um, uh, about loving cybernetics. I have one of them in there. So that's it. Worth the file? That's it? That's it? All right. I agree with most of, but not all of your arguments. Uh, and if we frame your arguments within the context of the conception of the rise of the technosphere, that whole sphere of human uh, addition of activity but, and materiality that is now as great almost in mass and variety as the biosphere, then this is just one manifestation of how the technosphere has subsumed human agency. And that has manifestations not only in algorithm design and other things of that nature, but of the, the cultural appropriation of technological innovation, such as um, if you like, driverless cars, which solve a North American uh, uh, myth or something, which, uh, to which there is no particular issue to which it's trying to address. Uh, uh, a lot of uh, other technologies which uh, fail to appreciate the energy and environmental impacts. AI is, will be, if it ever takes off, one of the biggest users of energy in the globe. Uh, and Google searches is already one of the biggest users of energy in the world. So we are on a trajectory through technology which is absolutely counter to the Anthropocene demands and exigencies of human existence at the moment. Well, there is a difference, and I, I know I could have gone more deeper into other issues like energy. But the energy is not a question of agency. We need energy. and. My point is actually that I would say that cybernetics has been a revolutionary technology, a revolutionary ideas 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, and it has had very negative effects. We, I think, are, I think I'm <coughs> obligated to be sure that we don't continue to do the kind of things that are harmful for human beings. I agree with you. I'm not and so that I think we are obligated as a, as a cyberneticians to be extremely careful, more than careful, being activists in, in, in finding ways of getting agency back. Okay, Gerald, Jude, Mark. Okay, uh, it's really not a question, it's more an opportunity. Um, Delia McNamara, who is a semi-regular visit to these conferences, has been hired by Canberra State Government in Australia to actually be their cyber ethics lead. And her analysis is fairly similar to yours. And she's actually got the responsibility of trying to work with all the techniques for producing these out algorithms to address it. And so it'd be really interesting to hear how that actually plays out in practice. Well, I, I give you the reference, and I will, uh, I'm happy to explore that and uh, see to that. Yeah. Jude. Klaus, I think of Herbert Brun, and I think of how he was the rebel, and that I see a lot of Herbert, even though you haven't mentioned him, in your desires as you present to this today. And I don't know what else to say about that. Next year. I mean, I'll say one more thing. Yes. And that is, it just popped up. 
And that is anti-communication. It is not gibberish. There's gibberish, there's a seduction, the language, and there's communication. And Bruhn's anti-communication was trying to speak to the ASC and did speak to many members of the ASC. I mean, he affected my life for big time. And um, I just think it's really interesting well, I, where I you know, are. I know that I know a little bit about Herbert Bruhn, but, uh, but I, I think the issue of language is not something he was that deeply in. He, he also he he was all about language. Says, we live in language. It's very easy to say, but it's much more difficult to say when you make a statement, like for example, declaring war, then the war comes. And or when you when you I mean these well. are language acts and language changes the reality. The right. way or reality we live in repeat and act. My on. point. And so that is part of uh, accepting uh, algorithms, which I think we have to be very careful. That's all I'm going to say. Mark. Uh, first, I just wanted to mention a possible addition to the book list. And it's a, the book is called Algorithms of Oppression by Sophia Noble. I don't and know it, but just thank you that I will explore it. She starts off with the racism and sexism that come about when one does uh, search engine searches and then takes off from there in, in some related aspects. And then I'm also just curious, I don't know if we can really resolve in this conversation, but the relation between structural determinism that Matrana talks about and agency, um, there I'm just curious whether they're opposed or they're actually, those two books are in the same direction. Well, I would, and having to do with the deniability of what people are doing when they create structures. What are the two issues? I would what are say two structures issues? have no agency. Well, structures are <laughs> the results of many people interacting with each other, complying on, on agreeing, but ultimately it boils down to people interacting. <coughs> the, the, the structures, like I mean, determinism, uh, architectural structures, they are just there. The social structures. If there are no people, they are not effective. I mean, they, they, are not, they are not there unless people act on it. So, you have the question. Yeah. Um, I mean, you would talk in that favor, and I think it's interesting. I've been thinking that um, for critical thinking that it does help to, to look at and so true. And, um, you know, people wrote about bureaucracy. And sometimes people misinterpret what he said. They say, said he talked about bureaucracy as being rational. Um, and people think that's a good thing, but but he did um, talk about the downside that the rationality means it's rule bound, and algorithms are rules, right? And um, and he talked about the iron age of bureaucracy. So I think you know one thing that's happened is that that we have this um, you know computerized, technologically enhanced version of bureaucracy, and that 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 I think the critical thinking is to look at that wedding of, of bureaucracy with, with, the, with the technology and where it's gotten us. Well, that, that kick, uh, brings to mind a quote that I think about from whom is a Stanford um, uh, theorist uh, about understanding computers. Um, I don't know. Yeah. He said, basically, artificial intelligence is like bureaucracy. Whereas human intelligence is in action. And it is true. <coughs> because uh, the ideal bureaucracy is, as you say, rational. It's, you, you have a calculus, and that can be easily transformed into an algorithm. And that's the reason why, in fact, so many bureaucracies get into the issue of algorithms and become algorithmized and, and they're big machines. And you cannot really do very much about it except that you. you Perhaps build other kinds. Yeah, that's why. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to call a close to the official part of this session now. Thank you. But if people want to, well, it's so close. If you do want to keep conversation going. No, no, you have to uh, I'm, I'm closing the official part, but I mean, Fine. people will do what they do. But this is the end of this Thank official you. session. Thank you very much.